So I, I begin by telling you that I feel this weird feeling because I'm one of the left right brain. I'm the other one. Um, I'm not the creative type. I'm the computer scientist. And I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, you know, as, as we go, oh, let me see if I can, one of these does next. How about that one? No? Uh, the big arrow would be very good. And so when I asked what I was even supposed to talk about at this sort of uh, a get together, Megan gave me five things to talk about. And so I'll focus probably on a couple of them. And if I do them too poorly, you can grab me uh, during the break to talk through a little bit. So I want to say first a little bit about me. I'm a computer scientist. So I'm one of the ones who builds the tools. And I'll come back to this in a minute why it's relevant. The other reason which makes it a little bit interesting for me is I did the opposite. So I was interested in how to students learn computer science, how to teach it, and I wanted to use storytelling as a medium to get students engaged in programming rather than in any ways uh, the other way around. And so with my colleagues, um, Wanda Dan and uh, the late Randy Pausch, we built a system about 20 years ago called Alice, uh, which I think I have a slide on, um, which does 3D interactive animation. The student is the author. So the student is a storyteller, the student builds the game, and Randy used the term a head fake a lot. The idea is you're supposed to think you're doing one thing, but what you're really doing is something very different. In this case, the student thought they were directing the next great American movie or whatever it was, or building a cool video game, and what they were really doing was learning how to program. Uh, ultimately targeted for quite young. We started with college kids, dropped it down to high school to middle school, um, and that's you know, a little bit where we went. Um, I'm not gonna talk a whole heck of a lot about Alice because you know, if you're interested, you can catch me to talk about it, um, but that was a little bit of where I got into this other side. Um, I need to say a little bit about the Rake School, which is where I've been invited to come to direct. Um, it's an undergraduate honors college, much as what Megan's going to have here with the Carson Center. It draws typically a little bit of a different caliber of student than uh, much of UNL. UNL pulls great students. Um, the Rake School pulls truly exceptional students. So these are students who are considering the top half of the Ivy Leagues, um, Stanford, MIT, Duke, Georgia Tech, perhaps, as the other school that they're going to go to if they choose not to come to Rakes, uh, et cetera. And so it allows, one of the nice things an elite program does, and as we're going to be thinking about the curriculum and the drawing of an exceptional student, is having these flagship programs as the Carson Center is about to become, or already is, but this new program is going to enable us to do, is it allows you to become a flagship for the university and indeed for the state. Um, my, my kids are most of the technical kids, so they tend to be mostly computer scientists, engineers, business students, no requirement. We actually don't give a degree, but half of their classes, a little bit over half of their classes, are going to be in the Rakes College. Um, and most of our focus tends to be on design thinking, model thinking, big data analytics, thinking about how to solve problems, etc. Um, one of the interesting parts, and I want you guys to think about this as we begin helping Megan perhaps this afternoon thinking about her curriculum, is we have two year-long capstones. Students as juniors start this year-long capstone with real clients, and then the students will redo it with potentially a new client, a new sponsor, their senior year where they take more leadership roles. So these are real projects for real clients, mostly tech-focused, but they don't have to be. I've been meeting with folks talking about more data science projects, more creative projects, and the best ones are always uh, multidisciplinary across uh, really many, many fields. And the sponsor, the client, will provide a little bit of money, and more importantly than the money, they'll actually provide staff, a staff person to work with the team regularly to give feedback on behalf of the company. And in exchange, the sponsor gets potentially labor, probably the most valuable thing for the sponsor, is the ability to look at students and try and get the students. Of course, the smartest sponsors not only steal their own students to come work for them, but for the other project, sponsor, the other project students as well. Um, and they get a solution to the problem, potentially uh, uh, the solution they wanted, perhaps a different one, and they develop relationships as a way to get labor and to be, uh, build a relationship with the school. Certainly the best projects we've seen are the ones that span multiple disciplines. I give an example from last year where a medical doctor approached us and the team ultimately had this idea that based on the way you bite can predict your recovery from stroke. And so a team actually built a device that goes into your mouth, you bite down, they managed to hook the signal up and used various machine learning algorithms to analyze the signal to predict good bite patterns and bite, bad bite patterns. Again, in this case, it was mostly engineering-ish, but the, uh, taking from mechanical engineers to electrical engineers, computer engineers, computer scientists. Um, 
Obviously, it has to, a lot of things have to be built in, and some of the UI UX work was beyond the capability of the team, but those are the sorts of projects that tend to be quite good for us to do. And they tend to, best projects tend to be ill-formed where the client doesn't quite know what they want. <laughs> it just, you know, the kids are pretty creative. <laughs> So Megan asked me about emerging media arts, and I tell you, I feel embarrassed to say I want to shrink down below the podium so I don't have to say in terms of it, because I'm not the expert. You know, many of the people in this room are much more expert than I am in terms of to work through. I get the sense that this, it's a, some, some sort of a, com, uh, a combination of creative arts, uh, computing, and engineering. I like the interactivity because that's a lot of what I've done, and it just means to communicate, but this is something which we can uh, talk. The one question which I think about a lot as a computer scientist, is to what extent does the technology drive what gets done versus to what extent does this community help drive the technology? And as a computer scientist, I oftentimes myself, because I can build the tools and we do build the tools, as being the wrong way. We build something and say, use it, which is kind of awesome, but it's wrong because guess what? We don't know the right things and we're not thinking they're five and 10 and 15 years. Imagine what it would be if every tech company had to put a science fiction writer on their staff for every single project. It would be awesome what we could build. Um, and I think that that's an important thing. Um, C.P. Snow, what, 60 or 70 years ago, talked about the two cultures. This, the difference between, he was talking about science, and I think of it more computer science now, and the arts. And this gap of mutual incomprehensibility between the two sides. And this is clearly limiting, and I think this center has the opportunity to change that, to bring in this connection between the fields rather than saying, you're in this building, I'm in this building, we never talk to each other. And I hope we can help have the emerging media arts to drive the technology and we can build technological solutions based on what's, need, what's needed rather than the other way around. So, um, Megan asked a little bit, because I know she's been thinking a lot about where should the role of creative coding fit. And, um, you know, I think about all coding is creative, just I'm a computer scientist, you know, in terms of it. But the idea is really focusing on the expressiveness rather than just building something which is purely just uh, useful or functional in terms of it. And, you know, I think about some of my own experiences as computer scientists, I can build anything. You know, we can build tools, libraries, environments to solve any sort of a problem. But this has to be done together in terms of what can be built. I think of a couple of projects that I've used for second semester uh, students uh, back when I was at Stanford. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to have time to teach here yet. But certainly when I was at Stanford, I had a chance to teach some. So I think about an assignment I gave second semester students uh, building Mondrian style art. It's a simple exercise of understanding recursion and how it works. Of course, what I didn't teach is how color composition works or how patterns work. So most of the art the students actually built was quite hideous. Um, <laughs> because they didn't think about it. It wasn't, the, it wasn't just breaking up the canvas into sub-canvases. You actually had to think holistically about the whole thing. I think about another assignment I gave, um, which involved, um, we were doing things like linked lists and stacks, and what we were doing was we wanted to automatically generate ra uh, text in the style of an author. And so we're using this technique called hidden Markov models. I don't care so much about the details, but we'd read in a bunch of text, and then through a random uh, a probabilistic approach, we would then generate text. It doesn't work so well for Shakespeare. I'm a big fan of the historical plays. You feed it in, and then you get the stuff which makes no sense. But one of my students who wrote a solution to this did a remarkable job with soap operas. She took a bunch of text from Days of Our Lives. She needed to seed it with, I think it was eight words. I was trying to remember what the words were. I remember it was boyfriend, affair, sex, and five other words. And with that, she actually generated text that actually, from my perspective, as a non-soap um, opera fan, was actually better than what I was reading in her diagrams, which maybe talks about quality literature versus less quality literature, not being a value standpoint. Um, but the thing being is you can do that. You can build anything you want to be able to build, but what we have to do together is to figure out what needs to be capable to be done and what libraries we need to provide as computer scientists to the media arts, to the emerging arts. Because I know we don't do it right on our own because I saw my Mondrian art and I won't share it with you, but it didn't come out right. Um, that was cool, the idea was right, just didn't work. And I read about what happened with the, uh, I remember I think uh, a student did it for Middlemarch and what he wound up with was utter gibberish. It was kind of cool in the style, but it wasn't quite that good. 
Um, <clears throat> so to talk about a little bit about the possibilities, and we're going to be spending some time talking about it, is Carson is brand new. We get a chance to help Megan to build a curriculum from scratch and to really make this you know, amazing program. Rakes exists. It's existed for about 15 years. We have many similar goals, and so I see clear opportunities for overlap. We're interested in innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, building real solutions, real problems, helping to get our students jobs. I mean, this is kind of an important thing to do. Um, you know, I, I see it clearly as the opportunity of what would it be like to build not only interdisciplinary teams within Rakes, but what if you mix it with Rakes and Carson? What could you do then when you put a bunch of artists together with computer scientists, business people, engineers? Wow you know, taking a 10-person team. You know, when Susan was talking about her real-world teams, I was looking, okay, I got about four or five of those covered in my program, and Regan's going to have another bunch of those covered in her program. What can't we actually solve when we have students who don't realize certain things are impossible to do? And so I'm clearly very excited about the possibility. I don't know what the right team should look like, and I'm very excited about the possibility in terms of what conversations we're going to have over the next day or change to be able to do some really neat things. Um, and then also to figure out together what are the right technological solutions, because I think it should be the media arts that should drive technology, which is historically not what has happened. There's a bunch of computer scientists building cool libraries to make music sounds or to make, uh, be able to draw lines on screens. And maybe that's cool technologically, but it maybe doesn't help solve the real problem of the arts. Okay, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. <laughs>